The three musketeers at the back are making noise. <laughs> I mean, you can just go for the free lunches. Hey, yeah. <laughs> That's why I get paid. <laughs> That's even better. I mean, honestly. I know. I, I know. I mean, <laughs> and don't tell anybody I, say, I said that. I hope we're not recording yet. Liz, is the camera on? No. Good. So I wasn't recorded. That's good. <laughs> Okay, because here goes my tenure promotion. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, so make sure that you cut anything unwanted from that when you. Okay, okay. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we'll try to keep this short and nice and easy because I know it's after lunch and you're getting. Uh, using uh, Melinda's term, like literacy overdose these couple days. So <laughs> we will try to keep this as short and simple as possible. So my first question, since we, are, we will be talking about plagiarism, how many cases of plagiarism, I mean, this is for continuing faculty, how many cases of plagiarism do you usually deal with every semester? Jason, don't raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Jason is an exceptional. Is that victory or these are two cases? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, sometimes it's zero. Yeah, it's zero to one. Uh, sometimes it's one. Sometimes you, you hit the jackpot, apparently. Usually there's always one in some. If it misses Jason, you mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we're coming to this. Yeah. We're coming. Like, at least one, some shape or form. Yeah. How much of it was accidentally it doesn't cite your source, right? Yeah, or did you just not pay attention to the citation yeah. at all? Or oh, did you just stop fair reading? <laughs> <laughs> did you panic at the very end? That's also the case. Yeah. No, it yeah. counts as a paraphrase. I changed a word. <laughs> Interesting. OK. So we all deal with that in a way or another. I mean, last fall, this was my last semester teaching first year comp. And I was teaching only one section of 1020, I mean, with my graduate course. But apparently, I hit the jackpot. It missed Jason's class that semester. And all came to my class. I had two. And they both failed the course. And one of them ended with a hearing. Oh, oh yeah. That's the fun part of dealing with plagiarism. But it's the, as we always say, the hazard of the job. So we have to do it anyway. So some of you already started talking about the types of plagiarism, so, or what we call plagiarism. So what are the types? Amy, you start because you said the, one of the most important ones. Pass writing. And what is that? And Amy is trying to be very nice and in her <laughs> word choice. Yeah. Okay, yes. So they're but just modifying a word here, a word there. So they're not making any significant uh, uh, changes, conceptual changes. They're, they're basically repeating the same sentence or the structure, um, maybe changing a few words, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's it. So it still mirrors. OK, so what the difference between what you just described and what happens when students just copy and paste large chunks of text? What's the difference? Honest to goodness, when they're pass writing, they think they're doing it right. They think that by modifying some of the language that they are putting it in their own order. 
Mm -hmm. So they're not, they don't think they're stealing. Or they then turn it in and won't catch it that way if they change a word here or a word there. Mm -hmm. Basically, you're referring to the more honest students making mistakes. I'm referring to the less honest ones. <laughs> you will get both. Yes, it's a continuum. Like, we have to acknowledge that. It's not like one size fits all because we, we get to see all types of that in our classes. But patch writing has another meaning other than the one Amy gave, which is like more commonly seen in our, in our classes. But what's the other one? Mm -hmm. But it was one paragraph, but everything else was his and didn't match up with anything yeah. else. Yeah, this, this means that both students yeah. got that from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. yeah, if it, some yeah, because definitely he didn't contact somebody in Illinois to get that. This is, these are exactly what we mean mostly by patch writing, that most of the writing is not actually their own, but instead of just copying and pasting big chunks from one source, they want to sound smart, so they start like mix and matching. <laughs> so they start getting exactly like what Jason and Angela said. Few sentences from here, from sentences from there, put them together, hey, I have a paper, and what that? Frankenpaper. A chimera. Uh, yeah, but it's a pseudo paper, if we can call it such. So this is exactly what patch writing is. So we have patch writing. We have people who think that they paraphrase, but actually they didn't paraphrase because they kept almost everything intact. So Turnitin or Sefasan can still catch that. What else? Self plagiarism, yeah, or recycling. Exactly, and I'm coming to this, <laughs> Sabrina. Mm -hmm. And this is a very good example of students freaking out at the very last minute because they didn't spend much time working on their paper, developing ideas, brainstorming, doing research. So it's like, take the shortcut, just copy and paste. Or somebody who hasn't done their work at all, mm -hmm. and then it's like, whoops, there is a draft or a, a paper due at midnight. So it's like, okay, let's find some, some, something to put together. Donna? We're discussing that tomorrow, actually. Okay, so it's so the lady sitting in front of you is yes, the one handling that tomorrow. Two roommates, they wrote the paper together and then turned them into me and another instructor. They thought it was okay because they actually did write it together, but they wrote one paper. Collaborative learning. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, this is what students do when they collaborate. Yes, Zach.
guess you weren't so good at writing, they would give like another dude 50 bucks to, to put something together. I've had that, that, I've yeah. had that several times in my previous, previous institution. Yeah, right. We had like some, <laughs> some students who were like quite wealthy and they would pay other students to pay or other people to write their papers. And I'm coming to that in a minute. Uh, Melinda and then Angela. Angela? I, I was conferencing with one student and asked her what she, what a sentence meant, and she was like, I don't know, my mom wrote that. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. yeah. my mom oh, you haven't had any person's mom writing their paper? No, they don't have to be an English teacher, believe me. Uh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Most probably, if they are English teacher, they would have more common sense I than doing that. I, I heard somebody over there say, "My mom's an English teacher." Yeah, no, my I had a student whose mother helped her write a paper, and she said her mother wrote the paper. Ah. Uh, uh, yeah. But no. yeah. Nice. So we all deal with all types of stuff when it comes to plagiarism and cheating in our classes. So before we talk about how to detect that and how to handle that, let's be more proactive and talk about how to prevent that from happening. I know this is not, nothing in our world works 100%, but we at least try to curb that as much as possible. So what are some of the strategies that you do in order to prevent or to curb plagiarism in your classes as much as possible? Sure. Day one, when describing it, what I do is I try and put the <laughs> it will be like the chair and the director looking at your work one on one. Have a good time. Keep keep, keep keep the poor director out of it. The director has nothing to do okay. with it. I'm, as I'm going to explain that in a minute. I have nothing to do with that, by the way. It's all the director and above. Uh, sorry, the chair and above. So I try and <laughs> what being in that position would be like. So hopefully that's scarier than turning in a short paper. I mean, I wouldn't mind using that approach at all. If it works in for you, keep doing it. Jason. I, I have them do a lot of their writing in class. I go around, I look at their writing. I have them get in groups and look over each other's writing. So, you know, so basically they're not having much of a chance to plagiarize, you know, until they get home and do anyway. Y yeah, I mean, Ron. I think a lot of the, the plagiarism that you get is caused from fear. Mm -hmm. They've never been in this situation mm -hmm. before. They're afraid they can't and they're terrified, and they they tend to try to get extra help in ways that they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. So one, yeah, of the help. Things, it's one of the things I try to do, and I think everybody probably tries to do the same thing, is to set them more at ease at the very beginning of the semester. Mm -hmm. uh, have them read things like shitty first draft. Mm -hmm. So they'll expect not to be perfect to begin Thank with. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is totally opposite of Sue's yeah. approach. Yeah. but. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Clay and then Liz. Usually what I do when I'm going over the, the, the plagiarism section is I talk about what constitutes plagiarism, and I try to emphasize that it requires intent, that you know, if you make a mistake and something happens, then if you rectify it because it's a mistake, that's not technically plagiarism in the larger sense. But if you do it knowingly, you know, knowing that that's not yours and you're representing it as yours, then that's the big plagiarism. Okay, I'll let Melinda answer you because I think she's going to say what I was going to say. So, no. Melinda? <laughs> yes. Yep. Absolutely. The law doesn't protect ignorance. So, Liz and then Hillary. Yes. Good luck word and face a sign and 
have them review their safety plan report before the deadline so that they can check their own work prior to it coming to my hands or this one's desk. So that's Perfect. Two people. Yes. Work. Hillary. Uh, when I was teaching SLA level ESL, something I would do after I would teach a lesson on what plagiarism was, I would draft up like a good faith contract between me and the student. Not like a legal piece of paper, of course, but just something that kind of makes it more personal between me and them on mm -hmm. the history that plagiarism is and what happened. We used to do that here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Angela? Exactly. And also try to avoid having them post their stuff for free access online. Mm -hmm. I used to do that, and then I found some of my own students' papers copied in later classes. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oops, mm -hmm. that's on me. <laughs> yeah, that's why I never put comp classes on Padlet, for example. Yeah. I do graduate and upper level courses because the chance of plagiarizing in these courses is quite much less than it happens in first year calm. So I don't have to worry much about that. Or I mean, I still worry about it, but it's not as much as it happens in first year calm. Any more ideas on how to prevent that from happening? OK, so you summed up most of the points I was going to point out here. So <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I'm here in the first place, but bear up with me. So uh, in the Google folder, so not the Google folder. I, bl I blame Jason for that because he just shared with me something from Google. So on Blackboard, under the professional development, we have the uh, pre-fall training, and all these documents are there. So the definition of plagiarism is occurs when a writer deliberately uses someone else's language. And this kind of like sounds aligned with what Clay said, but when it comes to handling that, we'll, we need to deal with it the same, whether it's intentional or not, or other original, not common knowledge material without acknowledging its source. Something that I'd like to caution you against is using the word steal, because we, th we use this word a lot when it comes to plagiarism. You're stealing other people's ideas. If you think more about the word steal, it means that you take something and that person doesn't have it anymore. Mm -hmm. If I steal her notebook, she doesn't have it anymore. And I made a deliberate <laughs> decision of whom to take. Okay? So, but with ideas, this is not really the case because the other person still has the idea. It wasn't taken from him totally. So that's why the word steal may not be the best word to use here. OK, but lack of attribution, don't give credit, or any other way of phrasing that, that's totally acceptable. Now, best practices of preventing that. As many of you said, number one, the statement that you put in your syllabus. Because as Hillary said, we don't need an additional contract that nobody's going to read, for the Lord's sake. So let's put it in the syllabus. And that's why it's now a main requirement by the university and the college and the department that we include that statement in our uh, syllabus. Second thing is have a conversation about it. Use either approach. Show's approach is like, you'll be in hell if you do that. <laughs> or you'll be sitting in that room with monsters, also known as the, de the program director, department chair, and whoever is above them. Or Ron's approach, which I very much encouraged to have that kind of conversation with your students. This is one statement in the syllabus. If you don't go over all the syllabus in class and ask students to read it on their own or have a quiz or anything, this is one thing that doesn't get 
through with just reading and quizzing. You need to have that conversation with them. What it means and the consequences. Be upfront with them. This is what happens. And that's why the more detailed version of the statement that we are adopting this semester is much better than the older one because it, put, it lays out the consequences very clearly. It's like there is no way to misinterpret that or to read it in, the, in, in different ways. Include a statement about plagiarism in all your assignment sheets. This saved my life when I had that hearing because students forget about what's in the syllabus comes week two, if even that far. So good nudge, each assignment sheet. I have that statement at the end of the assignment sheet. Any sign of plagiarism in this assignment, in the final draft, it means you fail this assignment. Done. There is no other way of interpreting that. And nobody can say, oh, I forgot what was there in the syllabus, although this is not an excuse. But still, it's like, uh, actually, this was just like in the assignment sheet. And then allow students to see the originality report, something that Liz said. This works very well. <coughs> there is an option in Safe Assign. I don't use Turnitin, and I 100% encourage everybody not to use Turnitin. This is a bad business model. And I don't know if you've read about that, but earlier this summer, they sold all their database for millions of dollars. This database came from students' work that you unintentionally sell them or like allow turn them to have access to. So safe assign because Everything is still within our control, not to there. You don't use their server like what we do with Turnitin. You don't have a separate, separate account. It's all within Blackboard and AOM. So please don't use Turnitin. And of course, it creates lots of trouble with portfolio later because it doesn't transfer stuff to the portfolio easily. But this is a side point. I'm, let's focus now here. So allow them to see that originality report. Like, allow multiple submissions for students, not just one submission for the assignment. So they can submit that assignment earlier. And if you check that box that they can see the originality report, they can look at it and see, oh, whoops, I forgot to do that citation here. Or So if it's a sloppy mistake, they have the chance to remedy that situation. And this brings us to what Melinda and Clay said earlier. It can be unintentional. This doesn't mean that we'll forgive it. Because, sorry, you have to be alert when you're doing this. But allowing them to see the originality report and submit another draft that's remedied from that problem, that's a good practice. Liz, you wanted to say something? Yeah. Yes. And I allow unlimited submissions. Absolutely. And I get a lot more questions about plagiarism because they're looking at their census assignment report than when I mm -hmm. didn't do that. Exactly. I like answering those questions. I know that's not plagiarism. That's you know, citation. That's fine. So it's, a, so it's more of a learning experience to the students as well. And at the same time, like once they ask the question once, that has taken the burden of you to have to like, conference with the student and question their, uh, their motives behind what you've seen. So it's like it cuts a lot of hassle later. So allowing them to see that originality report is very productive. Use readings as a way to engage students in sound attribution practices. Like when you are doing any of the readings, like, like what all the lectures did earlier today with the scaffolding reading, this is one thing you can direct students' attention to. What kind of attribution, how they are using sources, how these authors are using sources in their own reading, in, in their own writing that you're reading. So this can be another way of talking about this. Uh, keep samples of in-class process work. I know we all do process work. I mean, I don't have to talk about that much, and you already have a session after this to, dis to discuss process work. 
but keep samples of in-class writing, not something they did online, because that can be plagiarized in itself, <laughs> but something they do in class, like free writing at the beginning of class, reflection at the end of class, brainstorming activity during class. Collect these with students' names. You don't have to read them, just keep them. So when you have suspicion that that's not really your writing, go back to the sample and see if the language style, the voice, the sophistication of the ideas and everything matches. I've done that several times and you have no idea how many plagiarism cases, especially the one that Safe sign on turns in cannot catch, like if you hire somebody to write you a paper. Turns in cannot catch this. But comparing that against the sample you have will help you, whoops, these are totally different people. And the last one, don't allow change of topic between drafts. Don't you ever allow this, because what happens is, Students submit first drafts, receive great feedback from you that this is a failing paper. <laughs> it's like, why not? Why revise? Just come up with a new idea, find something ready-made, ask one classmate in another class or another school to give me their paper, I'll submit it, done. And if I ask, it's like, I didn't like that topic or I didn't find any no enough sources, I'll go ahead and, and change the topic. If they need to do that, they have to get your permission and they have to do at least a draft before submitting the final draft. Yes, Sabrina. This is in 1020, by the way. Yes. I do that in my class as well. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you write that first paper and you realize this was a great idea, but this is not going to work. In, in 1020, yeah. it's different because they have, sometimes they start with a very broad topic, very narrow topic, something that they cannot find sources for. So yeah, I agree. Once they submit their intended bibliography, this means that it's a done deal. But they can still change what they are. They can still alter what they are within the realm of that topic. So maybe Absolutely. Maybe the person would argue A, and then they realize, That's research. But they're stuck with the topic itself as their paper proof. Exactly. But in 103 and 1010, because the, the topics are open, <coughs> so they can change that. It's like, whoops, that's not going to get me the grade I want. So let me find another topic and find another paper and submit as a final draft. Don't allow this. Or have something that they have to get your permission, your approval to change the topic and why. OK? Now, for detecting plagiarism, because this is, so safe assign, and I explained why, and Liz, next week when we have the Blackboard Day, is going to show you that. Always read the originality report in detail and critically. Don't be fooled by the percentage. Seriously, I mean, I've had students with 50% uh, matching. And then when I started reading very carefully, it was either from their first drafts, uh, citations, like references at the end, quotations that are like well cited and everything and well integrated, but just because like two sentences match a source. And the percentage can be misleading as well, depending on the length of the paper. Like if it's, like if it's a graduate paper that's 15 pages, and I have 20%, but it's all in like short quotations and references, then it's nothing. Can you put drafts in place of time limits? I know for turn it in, which apparently that's the dirty word, then you can say uh, this assignment is a revision of the previous assignment. No, I, I mean, I never do that. Yes, if it's from the same student's paper. Okay. Yes. Melinda? Yeah, when um, I had a student who was 10 10 last semester do the same thing, 10 10, this semester was going to be the sample for the question. So it's other Not students. Kim, the student.
see that sound effect at the back. <laughs> Yes. So, like, if it's one choice, it'll be top ten. If you click on the one, it'll be and if you scroll to the second half of the originality report, you will have the matching. Mm -hmm. What's matching? This is much easier to look at than just the highlighted colors. The second half of the report is all the matching uh, pieces with their source. So you can really quickly identify whether this is like a false percentage or something that you should be concerned about. Okay, and the last one, this is like common sense to all of us. And again, it comes down to, as Jason said, Liz said, Ron said, how you build your assignments and how much process work you engage students in and how much of that process work you get access to and read routinely in your classes, in discussion posts, in drafts. So the more you do that, you get to know your students very well. So when you start seeing, like, wait a minute, this is not your writing style. What happened between like that shitty first draft and this elaborate A-level paper? Yeah, students Im improve on everything, but the change of voice, and I'm deferring to Kim for the last one, change of language use, language uh, structure and sentence structure, and change of font or color. Le oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I know she's the expert with that. Can you? Uh, Kim, would you please tell us more about the white uh, language? I, 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 like I said, I have my entire novel wording that I'm going to be changing to a new wording for all of that. And what I've had is students use different code to help out their work down in the work down. So they'll use white words. And all of this takes more effort than if they were just on the word to begin with. <laughs> they'll go and they'll either copy their paper over again or they'll just copy and paste something from Wikipedia. Or go on a rant or do whatever, they'll make it two point font at the end of their paper and then turn all the text white. So I have it in my syllabus as an extra thing that if you do anything to mess with it, make sure you're We're not trying to scare the new people, I promise. <laughs> It's not E for effort, okay? It's yeah. Z and for effort. The fact that I'm telling you about this and that it has happened in the past should tell you how well it's worked for those who tried it. Exactly, yes. How successful these students have been. Yes, Sabrina. Um, Kim had told me about that, but I had not ex experienced it myself at first until I, I, I taught music and uh, pre instrumental and alto forte twenty. And I didn't um, I didn't see it in the paper itself, but once I went to say the plan and they took off it in there to see what changes they've made to the previous draft before they come back. Because it pops up differently in there. And all of a sudden, there were these lyrics, these song lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, have it, have it. They're trying to entertain you. Ungrateful teacher. I'm like, wait, what? So I went back to the paper and I didn't see it there. I'm like, what's going on here? And so I ended up, you know. They are secretly the entertaining you. Apparently, <laughs> but I was like, The originality report. Yes, that is, they will show whatever it is in that text, no matter what color. I love the originality reports of Safe Assign. They are so revealing. Your white words are not a change of yeah. Or white lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sure. I think one of the ways I get around having people do that is I tell them I've seen hundreds of literacy narratives at, literacy narratives at this point. I know how long they are. I can just tell at a glance, oh, this is 750 words. It should be this many pages. If it's significantly short, I know something has been done. And I will check it by hand and by the originality report, and I will find it. And I will, and and I will get you. And I'll get, get you. In MLA format. Perfect. Now we come to the last part with that I need to, before we get to that, I need to emphasize how important this step is. Many of us, I'm not going to say like we are too kind, but sometimes we don't want to take the hassle of 
reporting these cases. And we have levels of reporting. And toward the end, I curated that flow chart for everybody. It's on uh, Blackboard, but let me go through it really quickly. Because this is the part that sometimes gets overlooked in our classes. So it's the first incident. This is the first time the student does any of that. If it's a process work, that's fine. This is what process work is meant to be, to help students learn and improve and get to where we want them to be. Discuss with the student and, e and email them in detail about that incident and your discussion. I think if I want to boil down this whole thing in one word, document in writing. Every single incident, it has to be done in writing. Because otherwise, it's going to bite you if you don't. And you reach the point that you have to report it up the chain, and you have to fail the students. Like, nobody told me about that before. It's like, but I talked to you. It's like, prove it. Every single thing has to be documented in writing. Process work, discuss with the student, and email them in detail, and give them the chance to fix that in their final draft. If the first incident happened in a final draft, like as we said, out of fear and anxiety, they didn't have time, whatever the reason. So they skipped the process. They skipped the process. We, we see that happen a lot, that students don't submit a first draft and then go directly to the final draft. And sometimes it's plagiarized or has some kind of plagiarism. In this case, you have number one, F in the final draft. And you discuss with the students. Next, you give them a chance to revise that paper because this is their first incident but it just happened in a final draft. So you give them an F and give them a chance to revise that paper and submit it to you within a designated time that you agree on. If it's OK, like if the revised version is clear, grade it on merit and give them their grade. Because they have learned from their mistake and they apparently maybe it was just a, a slip. Email the student, the chair, Dr. Kim Brackett, the Associate Dean, and Dr. Zoe Clark. Once the student gets an F on a paper, even if it's going to be revised, you have to document this because this is official. Because the student may actually fail to do that, and this will get us to the second, of, second incident. The student may have done the same thing in another course, and they have already gotten by that then you're encouraging the student that you can continue to do that, hoping that the teacher won't catch it. How do you we, we don't care. Oh. That's, why we That's why we document it. So when the administration has multiple reports about the same student, this is a case. Mm. This is all if it's a first incident. Yes, Marsha. Ma'am, so just to be clear, if somebody uh, uh, plagiarizes uh, first time on their final draft, I have to give them an F, then I'm to allow them to redo it and grade it as if it were turned in on time, mm -hmm. and also email somebody? Yes. You have to document that this student has done that. So if it happens again, this is their second incident. And if it happens again, this means that they are still willing to cheat their way around. That's okay. the problem. Yes, Melinda. You, you update your grade book and everything, but you're just documenting the plagiarism case, okay. not the grade. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Or you, you can you can just update it manually in in, in Blackboard. With the administration, it's not going to affect their grade in the course in any way. Okay. Now, if it's a second incident, this is when th things get so interesting. Of course, if it's a process work, you know the process. But if it's the second incident in a final draft, again, then F in the course, and this is what the new plagiarism statement in our syllabus is going to state. Second incident, it's a done deal. F in the course. Again. You email the student, 
you can talk to the student first, explain it to them in an email, and then do the letter that we have a copy of in our uh, syllabus materials on Blackboard. You email the student, the chair, Dr. John Havard, Dr. Kim Brackett, Associate Dean, Dr. Zoe Clark, Associate Provost for Undergrads, and Ms. Holly Benson, the Registrar, because this goes to the student's record directly. So we add Holly only if it's the second incident and the student is failing the course, not just an assignment. Holly doesn't care about an assignment. I mean, reflection is, is, is up to you, again, it's, if it's first incident or second incident. But any second incident, okay, normally this is how it, because again, if it's a process work, the student can still fix that. But if it comes again in final draft, the cover letter of the portfolio or anything, then done. Okay, Ron and then Jason. Yes, of course. You don't. You have nothing to worry about in other classes. This is this is how the administration can track if that student has done the same thing in other classes. Jason, if, if the first and second incident are both on the process work, should they fail the course or no? Uh, if they are willing to change that and fix the problem, because as Angela said, some students just don't listen. I mean, this is not ideal, but if they are willing to fix that problem by the final draft then it's okay. okay. Maybe sometimes it's a, second, it's a different type of plagiarism, like pat writing versus sloppy citations, for example. Yes, Andrew. Yeah, uh, over the summer, I had the student uh, plagiarize on a final draft, had done it in the process work. Mm -hmm. um, I met with him, I did all that. I met with him uh, in, the, in my office. You were telling me about that yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Word for word. You should have seen what happened in Jason's class. As if I couldn't read the time stamps. Or like if I, as if I didn't read them. Yep. So, and yeah, because uh, who said that we read our students' papers? Yeah, yeah, we just throw them like these are A's, these are B's done. And yeah. especially since it was the summer class, I went ahead and just failed him because copying someone else's writing, that th there's no like, well, I didn't understand. Yeah, I mean, oh, that, that's, that's an extreme case. That's <laughs> deliberate, intentional, 100% aware of what they are doing. <laughs> so please, I know this can be a problem, but you don't need, I mean, seriously, it doesn't take more than 15 minutes to document this. Anything that you have, just PDF and attach to the email, especially when, it, when we reach the severe case that they are failing the course. At the end of, yes, we have it already in uh, the syllabus materials on Blackboard. And as, as you can see, I shouldn't be copied on these emails. I'd like to see them because sometimes it's like, maybe we need to talk about this, okay? But officially, I shouldn't be on that because this is some, something that many of you don't recognize. I'm not anybody's boss in this university. John Havard is our boss. I'm not anybody's boss here. I don't have, I mean, so this is everything that has to do with your evaluation or whatever is the boss job, not mine. <laughs> Thank goodness. So I saw a hand. Yes, Keith. We yes, we have, I mean, we have to give them benefit of the doubt and we have to use it as a learning experience. If they like bail out of that, it's like, I don't care and I'll still do it again in my final draft, it's like, oh, it's on them. At least we have exhausted all, our, all the chances to educate them on this. I know this is like. 
yes, and it's not like an open period. They can submit it whenever they, they like or whenever their schedule allows. You have to set the time and communicate that in the email to them. So it's very clear that it's not like an open invitation for you guy to do whatever. Yeah, like n normally mayb maybe if it's like near the end of the week, give them after the weekend or like four or five days. It's totally up to you and in your estimation how much time they need to rewrite this paper or revise it or whatever. Zach and then Andrew. So my question with this is do I have to tell my students about this policy? Well, once you start reporting it up the chain, you have to. No, no, no. What, what I mean is like at the beginning, do I have to? And the reason I say this is because... I feel like it would be really easy for somebody to plagiarize on purpose on a final draft just to snake a little extension in there for free. No, no. I mean, if if it's a final draft, it has to be reported anyway. Yeah. It has to be reported. Oh, no, that's, no I, I know. What I'm saying is, like, at the beginning of the semester, do I have to explain all this process? You can if you want. Okay. You okay. No. I mean, you don't have to, yeah. but you can if you want. It's not, it's not in the It's not in the statement. It's not in the statement. Yeah. And if, when in doubt, always contact me. I mean, this is the one case you can talk to me about this stuff. <laughs> Just like, I'm not sure how to handle, and I, I've seen several of these before, like people are confused whether or not this is a plagiarism, and then they forward me the uh, originality report and the f paper and stuff, and then I can make a better judgment sometimes, okay? Exactly, because, and this is a problem when we don't report that. Students get that, uh, that the impression that they can, okay, these teachers are nice, I'm not, I can do whatever, nobody, nobody's going to report me up the chain. It's like, no. You have to be accountable. You have to be held accountable for everything you do in this class. Angela and, this kid, and then Kim. I, I assume that this she had her hand first, I'm sorry. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if it's like last, like if it's the, the cover letter of the portfolio, okay. and they plagiarize like big chunks there, it's like it's done. H how are you gonna do that? I mean, even if it's their yeah. first incident, I mean, it's it's done. Yeah, I, I was just saying like. Of course, we're not gonna uh, ask Holly to give us an extension to submit our final yeah. grades. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Holly's not gonna do that. Kim. I don't really know what it is called or like if it's even still in place, to be honest. Anyway, because of time, so this document and something I'd love for you to read. I didn't, I, it's available again on uh, Blackboard, WPA Statement on Best Practices for Plagiarism. It's amazing because it's written for writing people. So. It covers many of the stuff we already discussed here. It has something, it has some kind of other uh, sections for writing in general, not in comp, but it's very good statement. And both are under the pre-fall training materials. Okay, so you'll see here, this is the handout that I created and this is a WPA statement on plagiarism. Feel free to use any of that with your students if you want, like if you want to have the, the definition or anything from the WPA statement, <coughs> feel free to do that. Okay? Thank you so much, and I think now we're, yes, Amy? Um, may I just make a quick announcement? Absolutely. Uh,
Yes, Liz? Um, if you go into my AM and you're looking for Warhawk Learning, it is now called Curtis Second. Oh. oh. Yeah, everything's about Curtis now, so. <laughs> yeah, Curtis is occupying the university. Okay, just one last announcement. Guys, because of the dire heat situation here, <laughs> we're moving to Clement 114 tomorrow for the entire day. It's a computer, it's a computer lab, and because we have all general sessions we don't have breakout sessions tomorrow so we don't want to lose any of you before the semester starts uh well no we cannot have food in a computer lab i'm sorry we have to come back here for food in 224 as usual but we're not allowed to have food in computer labs but the people who, get, who feel comfortable right now yes it's 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 aggressively air conditioned there <laughs> which works very well for somebody who's about to die of this heat here okay okay it's time for process work with uh who's doing process work for i know liz is doing 103 of course 10 10 and 1020 okay you know your pl your spaces of course okay dismiss and i'll see you all tomorrow if you haven't grabbed your swag bag grab one from the back please